So at Embrace, you may not know this if you haven't been here for very long, but we have six values that guide our ministry and our life together. Um, I mean, these values are important. They, they really influence everything that we do. Um, they, they guide what we do. They influence our decisions that we make, the way that we do life together. And I want to read these for you. We're not going to talk about all of them this morning, but over the next few months, we're going to reference these. We're going to bring them to your attention. We may do a whole series on these at one point. We've done that in the past, but they still uh, feel just as true as they did you know, a few years back when we came up with these. But our first is that we keep Jesus at the center. We are gritty Christ followers. We are comfortable with being uncomfortable. We keep it real. We believe that church equals a diverse family. And we're also neighborhood focused. And today I want to highlight, just for a moment, the first and most important value, and that is Jesus at the center. You know, last week, if you were here, uh, my friend Justin Berenger was here, and he preached a challenging message where he called us as a church to draw the circle wide, to reach out and include everyone, to extend loving friendship to as many people as we possibly can. And he reminded us That we can do this without fear or worry because Jesus is at the center of the wide circle holding it all together. You know, one thing I've noticed, and I'm sure you all have noticed as well, is that many people in our world right now are very afraid. I'm afraid a lot of the time. (laughs) I've also noticed that many Christians are afraid. And I get it. I've struggled with fear my entire life, and I still do. There's a lot to be afraid of. But what I'm learning as I, you know, continue to get older and and gain a little bit more wisdom with each new year is that we cannot let fear guide our most important decisions in life. You know, I was talking with Rachel and Christina this week about Justin's message, draw the circle wide, And frankly, um, what what I was lamenting to them is that I feel like too many Christian groups right now are choosing the opposite path. That instead of drawing a wide circle to include as many people as possible, they're drawing smaller and smaller and smaller circles where everyone thinks the same, everyone looks the same, everyone holds the same beliefs and values and political views. And we're not just seeing this in the church, it's happening all over the place. Let's narrow our circle so we feel safe. We can defend ourselves against all the people out there that make us uncomfortable, right? Our world is is rapidly changing, and y'all see it, and I don't like change a whole lot. Most people don't, and and it's kind of scary. It's changing so fast. Like, it's insane when I think just even like four years ago, our world feels like totally different now than it did then, right? And and our culture has changed. And, and what we can do, you know, we can circle our wagons. We can insulate ourselves. We can defend ourselves. We can put out everybody that, that makes us feel, um, you know, some kind of way. Or we can choose to have faith, I think. <laughs> and we can reach out. We can open ourselves. We can adapt. And we can enter into the unknown. And that's scary to do that, right? But I believe that's what faith truly is. It's saying, I'm going to open my hands, and I'm going to be open, and I'm going to accept, and I'm going to try to love, and I'm going to try to reach out, even when it might be difficult. You know, at the beginning of the pandemic, we ask this question together in one of our online worship services, and it's the most important question for Christians. How do we carry on the ministry of Jesus in our current context? It's quite simple, right? But it's actually a pretty hard question to answer. How do we carry on the ministry of Jesus right now in 2022 in the place where we're living? You know, our entire faith is built on Jesus. We are Christians. You know what Christians mean? It's the Christ ones. It's the ones who are all about Jesus. That's how they first started being called Christians. People looked at them and they said, oh, those are the the Christ ones. Those are the ones who act like Jesus. Those are the ones who look like Jesus. Those are the ones who talk like Jesus. So they started being called the Christians, right? The the Christians. Our entire faith is built on Jesus. And so in our new reality of COVID-19, of vast wealth inequality, of racial inequity, of deep political division, 
declining church involvement, debilitating mental health issues, violence, rampant materialism, overwhelming militarism, mass incarceration, inflation, poverty, gender and sexual discrimination, environmental catastrophe, in light of all these awful things, the question we need to ask is, what does the ministry of Jesus look right now in our current context? How do we follow Jesus and continue his story in the midst of this new, yet not so new, reality? This is the ultimate question that we must wrestle with as we spend our year with Jesus. So today, I want to focus on the how. How do we do this? The content of what this looks like, we're going to have to flesh out for a long time. But how are we going to do it? Because this is really hard. It's really hard to continue on the ministry of Christ in a really challenging world. How do we keep following Jesus, keeping Him at the center when everything around us is difficult and downright scary? How do we carry on the ministry of Jesus in our current context? How do we continue reaching out? How do we draw that wide circle and stay courageous? How are we going to do it? Because Jesus' ministry isn't easy. Jesus never told you it was going to be easy when he called you. (laughs) He said it would be good. He's going to be with you. But he never told you it would be easy. The things he said and did got him into a lot of trouble and caused him and his friends a whole lot of problems. But they were able to stay. You know, I think about when I look at the story of Scripture, they were able to be fairly strong while Jesus was with them. Because if they had problems or they couldn't handle something, they could go to Jesus and ask for advice or assistance, right? I remember, you know, that story when the large crowd had gathered and they were all listening to Jesus' teachings and they were so excited about it. And they brought all these people to this place, probably far away from the town, And then they'd been out there for a while, and people started getting hungry because they didn't bring any food. And if I was leading an event, you know, and we had planned it, and people started getting hungry, and there was nowhere to get food, I'd start stressing out, like, what are we going to do? I ain't got enough money to feed all these people. I don't even have food to feed them with, right? So the disciples are stressing out. And they go to Jesus, and they're like, Jesus, we brought all these people out here, and it's dinner time, and they didn't have lunch. They didn't have breakfast. They're hungry. Like, we got to feed them. What are we going to do? Like, I ain't got no money. Do you got money, Jesus? Like, should we go to town and try to, you know, try to find something to feed them? And they were freaking out. And what, what did Jesus do? He was there, and so he helped them out. He told them what to do. He said, here's what you can do. And they were able to feed them all. But Jesus isn't here anymore. He went up into heaven right before their eyes. and He's not here. Wouldn't it be nice? If we could set up a Zoom meeting with Jesus, I would love that, you know, and be like, you're far away, but let's get on Zoom. We'll talk. We'll do FaceTime or something, and we'll brainstorm about what we need to be doing right now. Maybe you can help us, Jesus, to figure out how we continue on this work that you told us to keep doing so long ago. Wouldn't it be nice? We just had a lead team meeting before church. I'd love if Jesus could have been there with us, you know, like sitting in a chair right there with us, answering all our questions, because we had a lot of questions this morning. And be like, Jesus, I wish you could just give us the answers. Because you know them, I think. (laughs) Pretty sure. Wouldn't it be nice if we could invite Jesus over for dinner? Just feed off his vibes and energy. I mean, that would sustain me for years to come, right? If I could just have that meal with Jesus. But Jesus isn't here anymore. Or where is he? Where is he? Our text for this morning is from John chapter 14, verses 15 through 21 and 25 through 29. So if you want to go ahead and turn to 14, you can, but I'm going to read it in just a a couple of minutes. So Jesus spoke these words in John 14 while he was in the upper room in Jerusalem. They had gone on their journey to Jerusalem, right? Jerusalem was where, like, his ultimate fate of, of death was waiting him. And so they were in Jerusalem. Things were getting hairy. It was starting to, to become a really dangerous situation for him, right, and for his people. And so he had some last moments. They were hiding out. You can think of it maybe like a safe house. It was a place they knew they could be safe from the authorities. No one knew where they were. They probably had some secret way to get there so they weren't found out. And so they were in the upper room of this house sharing some last moments together before he was arrested. And if you read this whole section in John, they call it the farewell discourse, then you can, you'll start to pick up on some repetition. And one thing that you can kind of see as you read through it is the disciples were panicked. They were very stressed, all right? Um, 
they, you can almost sense and just feel the panic in the disciples. And they repeatedly question Jesus in these chapters, wondering what's going on. And when you're with people who are just asking lots of questions, you're just like, hey, chill out, all right? Just relax. It's going to be okay. And so they're asking all these questions. Here are some that I was able just to pull out very quickly. Are you going to wash my feet, Jesus? Ask him what he means. Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? Lord, where are you going? Lord, why can't I follow you now? Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? What does he mean by a little while? These are just a few questions that they were asking. These disciples weren't, they weren't idiots. You know, sometimes we think of them like they were idiots. They, they were perceptive. They could see that things were changing. They knew that tension was mounting. They knew that it was becoming dangerous, that Jesus was acting different. And so during this final conversation, Jesus says some really ominous, dark things about troubled hearts, about being hated, about weeping, about mourning, about the disciples having a hard existence in the world. If you're with somebody and they're talking like this, you're going to be like, something going on here, right? And they were starting to get very nervous. And Jesus prayed that God would protect them. They're probably like, protect us from what, Jesus? Jesus knew that life was about to get really hard for his friends who had given their lives to his way. And he loved them so much. And, he, and it pained him, I would imagine, to think about his friends going through really hard times when he left. And he knew that he was going to be leaving them, that he wouldn't be with them to protect them, to have their backs, and to advocate for him. And so I, I want to read this section real quick from John chapter 14. And these are our verses uh, for today. This is the lectionary text plus just a little, a little bit more. Um, so we're going to start at John 14, verse 15. He says, If you love me, you will keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives within you and will be with you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before the long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in the Father and that you are in me and that I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Skip to verse 25. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. His message that he gave them was essentially this. Life hasn't been very easy for you up until now. However, life is actually about to get even harder. In fact, life is going to get really hard. I'm not going to be here to help you. I have to leave. But I'm not going to leave you alone. No way I'm going to leave you like orphans. If you keep this movement going, if you keep on going, then I'm going to help you out. I'm sending you another advocate like me, but even better. And this advocate is going to be with you, in you, giving you peace and strength and comfort and encouragement. You won't be alone. I'm sending you an advocate. Now, this advocate that he is talking about is the Holy Spirit. Something we need to pay attention to here is this. Jesus says, I'm sending you another advocate advocate. Jesus had been their advocate up until that point. He looked out for them. He had their backs. He stood up for them. He showed them what to do. He comforted them. He supported them. But since he had to go, he was going to give them another advocate. 
He's like, don't worry, I got somebody that's going to replace me and come in behind me, right? And this advocate, he says, will be even better than me and actually will be with you forever. Now, the word advocate here is a really important word in the New Testament. And it comes from a Greek word, paraclete. I know if y'all have heard me preach for the years, you've heard me talk about this before. But a paraclete is a person that we can call upon to help us in our most difficult times. It's a person that we can call upon to help us in our most difficult times. We could all use a paraclete, right? Who is someone maybe you call upon in your most difficult time? The word is likely connected to a person who would stand with you in trial. A paraclete would defend you, would stand with you, would support you. Be like a a really good attorney standing right there with you. If you're in trial, you want someone there with you, right? To help advocate for you before the judge or the jury, who or whoever is trying to determine your fate. This word has so many layers that the translators can't figure out how to translate it. When you, when you read the Bible and you get to a place like, and you're a little confused, look at other translations, because what you might see is that there's many different ways that it's been translated. We're reading an English translation of the old Greek and Hebrew text, right? And, and so we're getting some interpretation there. These are, these are humans trying to figure out how to translate ancient languages into modern-day English. And so I'll show you a few examples. The NIV calls the paraclete the advocate. The ESV calls the paraclete the helper. The KJV, the comforter. The CSB, a counselor. Those are all similar, but they're all different words, right? Scholars have argued that maybe we should just translate it as paraclete and create a new English word, right? Because it has too full of a meaning to be condensed down to one English word. Because the original hearers of this would have heard all of these things. A paraclete is an advocate, but also a comforter, a counselor, a helper. It's a Greek word that covers multiple English words in its meaning. And so here's a message for followers of Jesus. If you keep my commands, if you take my way seriously and actually live it out, the world's going to hate you, all right? Mistreat you, maybe persecute you. You'll have many troubles, but don't be afraid. I'm sending you the paraclete, the one who will come alongside you, who will advocate for you, who will help you, who will comfort you, who will counsel you, who will be there with you when you need help. For those in trouble, a paraclete is exactly what they need, right? But let me be honest with you. I'm a fairly privileged person, way more so than most, if all, the people reading the Bible in the first century. And I'll tell you something I've come to terms with is that my comfort in this life hinders my ability to understand the role of the Holy Spirit as comforter. Because sometimes I'm too comfortable and I don't get it that I actually need a comforter, right? And so I've had to think about it. If you don't feel a lot of Holy Spirit power in your life, then maybe you're too comfortable. (laughs) Maybe you need to think about that. Because why would we need a comforter if we're already comfortable? However, with people with their backs against the wall that feel trampled by our world, they would read this passage differently than I would. Because the idea of a paraclete, an advocate, a helper, a comforter, a counselor, would sound like really good news. Think about the first Christians. They were literally put on trial. I mean, y'all can read in Acts. Like, Paul and some others have to go to trial and stand before someone who has the power to do whatever they want with them. And so they actually go, went to trial. Many of them were then condemned at those trials, to unjust prison sentences, some of them even sentenced to execution. Now think about the idea of having someone who would stand right next to them in trial and, and, and be with them and advocate for them probably sounded like really wonderful news. That would give them courage and peace as they face these awful situations. You know, we, I wonder a lot how they faced torture and threats and lies, incredible persecution. Well, I think it's because they believed that the advocate was there with them. 
they truly believed and felt the presence of God right there with them in those moments. And it gave them the ability, just like many Christians throughout history, to withstand incredible hardship and pain and suffering because they had the paraclete, the advocate, the comforter, the helper, and the counselor. You know, I came across this story a few years ago, and I've shared it before, but it just really helps me understand this so much better. Bible translators in Central Africa at one point were having a hard time finding an appropriate word for this particular um, word, paraclete. How would they translate this into kind of the native language of some of these folks they were working with in Central Africa? How could they describe the Holy Spirit in a way that would make sense to these folks. And so one day, uh, some of these translators came across a group of men that were going out kind of into the bush carrying bundles on their heads. And they noticed that there was always one who didn't carry anything. And, and they assumed that that was the boss, right? Because the boss didn't have to carry. They tell the other people what to do um, to make sure maybe that the others were doing their work. However, they discovered that he wasn't the boss. He had a very special job within this group. He was there should anyone fall over with exhaustion. He would come alongside, pick up the man's load, and carry it for him. And this man was known by a word in that particular language, which literally meant the one who falls down beside us. The one who falls down beside us. And that was pretty close to what Jesus was saying in John 14 through 16 about the paraclete. The one who falls down beside us, who is with us, looking out for us, even in the trenches of this, you know, crazy warfare that we call life sometimes, right? How do we carry on the ministry of Jesus in our current context? How do we keep moving forward, sowing the seeds of the kingdom in our communities, even when everything seems so fragile? How do we stay on mission In the midst of madness? How do we keep drawing that wide circle? How do we keep getting up each day when we feel overwhelmed with our lives and our problems and our challenges? Well, you have an advocate, you have a comforter, you have a counselor, you have a helper, you have the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, the very presence of God living within you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.